Today we're going to talk about the number one blood test that's most overlooked when you're evaluating hair loss. So whether you have hair loss or thinning of the hair or just a general loss of volume, this video is for you. Now check this out. We, down here we have the hair follicle. There's a big confusion about what a follicle is. People think that a follicle is your hair. No, the follicle is the cavity that supports the hair. And what's interesting is the hair is not alive. The follicle is alive, but the hair is not actually alive. And then we have this little thing underneath the hair root called the dermal papilla. This is what regulates the growth stages. There's three of them. One is growth, which basically takes between two and seven years, okay? So your hair has a lifespan about two to seven years, and then it goes into this transition phase where it starts to loosen up. Then the third phase, which is the rest phase, which basically that hair releases, and then you have another one that replaces it. And so there's a lot that can go wrong with this area. You, you might have this powerful form of testosterone called DHT, which can burn out this follicle or interfere with the regulation of the growth, making the hair smaller or inhibiting this growth process. You also have scalp calcification around this root to the point where you're gonna lose blood supply. And this is why some people do scalp massages or they try to stimulate the scalp to get the blood flow, but they're dealing with scalp calcification. Now, the last point I wanna make about this thing right here is that not only regulates the growth stages, but it also regulates these stem cells, which are super important because the stem cells are kind of cells that don't really have a purpose. These are specifically gonna rest there and wait until you need them, and then they turn into a hair cell. Now let's get into what test would you possibly want to look at to ensure that you have the best chance of getting a full head of hair? Can you take a while guess what nutrient deficiency that would be? If you guessed D3, you are correct. But when you get your blood tested, unfortunately the doctor is usually gonna say, oh, it's normal, you're fine. So I'm gonna unpack some things about vitamin D. The first question is, are there any vitamin D genes associated to hair? or hair loss. One thing you need to know about vitamin D, vitamin D is not really a vitamin, it's a hormone, and it's involved in 10% of our genes. So we have like 25,000 genes. So that means it's involved with 2,500 different genes. And there just so happens to be several really important genes that if you don't have enough vitamin D, that gene will not get triggered to allow this growing process to occur. And specifically down here in, in this structure right here, the dermal papilla. So the first gene I'm gonna talk about is called beta catenin. This gene does a lot. It regulates the follicle with the stages of developing a hair. This gene also is essential for going through one phase to another phase. And so if there's not enough vitamin D, that's gonna trigger that gene, you're not gonna have this transition and you're really not gonna be able to grow the hair to the potential that you should. Now, I'm gonna list down all the genes in the description, but I just wanted to mention another gene, just the name of it because I thought it was kind of hilarious, sonic hedgehog gene. That's right, sonic hedgehog? Yeah, look it up, it's true. That's one of the genes that affects the hair that's controlled by vitamin D. So that's clue number one. Number two, are the receptors for vitamin D in this follicle? Absolutely, there's a high concentration of vitamin D receptors right around through this area right here. So that explains if you don't have enough vitamin D, you're not gonna feed the hair what it needs to grow. Next question I wanna ask is, what about alopecia? Isn't that an autoimmune disease? The answer is yes. And aren't autoimmune diseases related to a vitamin D deficiency? And the answer is yes. Without vitamin D, your immune system is really at risk for developing autoimmune diseases. This is why one of the most potent remedies for any autoimmune disease is high levels of vitamin D. Number one, because it gets rid of the inflammation, but number two, what vitamin D does to your T cells in helping put control over the T cells so they can now differentiate between a normal cell or something else. Because what is an autoimmune disease? It's your own body attacking itself because it can't tell the difference between your cell in something else. Vitamin D regulates that whole process. All right, the next question is related to the scalp. Is there any condition related to the scalp that is related to vitamin D? And the answer is yes. Psoriasis on the scalp or on your skin, 
that can be a severe vitamin D deficiency. Dandruff is also related to a vitamin D deficiency, as well as almost every dermatitis, because the remedy for all these different types of skin inflammatory diseases is prednisone. What is prednisone? It's a steroid. What does a steroid do? It gets rid of inflammation. Vitamin D is one of the most potent anti-inflammatories, but it doesn't come with all the side effects, if any side effects. Because if you have too much buildup of calcium underneath your scalp, around this hair follicle, it's gonna starve off the blood flow, the oxygen to that hair, and it's gonna die. So you're gonna have hair loss. But the question is, how does this relate to vitamin D? Well, there's another little key to this mystery, and that is magnesium is the most potent regulator of calcium. Whether you have calcium building up inside your cell or your mitochondria, magnesium is the regulator of that. If you've watched any of my other videos, I might've talked about vitamin K2 regulating calcium. That's true, but magnesium is the cofactor to allow the enzymes for vitamin K2 to work. So magnesium is at the bottom of a lot of calcification problems. Vitamin D is number one, magnesium is number two. Why? Because magnesium is involved with 300 different enzymes. And there's actually six of those enzymes that relate to hair. And so if we don't have the right mineral in the hair, we can't develop the structure of the hair. Another one is just in the energy production of the hair growth. There, it takes energy to grow hair. And magnesium is at the heart of making energy. All of the energy in your body cannot be created without magnesium. There are three different places in the biochemistry of vitamin D where if you don't have magnesium, vitamin D cannot be produced. So that's how it relates. We need magnesium for vitamin D. We also need magnesium to prevent calcification in the scalp. So magnesium is really important, but the question is why didn't I mention two different blood tests to do, magnesium and vitamin D? Because you cannot test magnesium in your blood and get any accurate information. Out of all the magnesium in your body, only 1% of that is in the blood. The rest of it is in different places, mainly inside the cell in different places. So when you test magnesium in the blood, you do not get a very accurate picture of what's going on in the cells. So it's very difficult to test magnesium. Some people might be willing to do a biopsy. That's a great way to test it. There are other tests to do, but they're, they're more difficult and they're not easy to do. In fact, I know a lot of doctors and I don't know one doctor who ever ordered those tests. So magnesium is difficult to test. It's involved in a lot of different things, 300 different enzymes, including vitamin D, as well as this calcification thing in your scalp. And most people are deficient in magnesium because it's not easy to get. And even the doctors don't recognize it because it's not tested. So that answers this question right here. Yes, magnesium is involved with a lot of different enzymes related to hair loss, but I'm primarily recommending it to allow vitamin D to work. Now let's get into the testing of vitamin D. So you go to your doctor and he or she says, oh, you have normal vitamin D levels. Okay, so you're okay. And let's say it's on the low end, like 20 or even 30, or even maybe sometimes 40. Well, what's not very commonly known is there's two systems of vitamin D, okay? We have one system that feeds the calcium and the bone, but we have another system that has other functions that go beyond calcium, like restoring and maintaining and regulating growth of your hair. All the vitamin D functions of this work off this other system, which is very, very different. I mean, just take a look at what happens. You get the sun, you eat vitamin D from the food, you take supplements. It goes into your blood. Most of this vitamin D is feeding the calcium in your bone, but very little of it is feeding these other functions. I'm talking about your skin, your hair, your immune system, your gut, very tiny bits of this right here. I'm talking like 0.04% of this vitamin D in your blood. So where is the vitamin D coming from? It's coming from either the sun, the vitamin D in your food, or the supplements. This is a different type of vitamin D. There's actually three different types of vitamin D, and this is where you're getting most of it right through in here. If you're getting daily sun, if you're eating the right kind of foods, and if you take vitamin D on a daily basis, because the thing about this form of vitamin D, it only has a 24 hour half-life, okay? This is like two to three weeks, 24 hours. 
This means you need daily amounts of either sun or the vitamin D from the food or the supplements. And people don't realize this. This is why we have such a massive epidemic of a vitamin D deficiency problem worldwide. In fact, the average person, depending on where you are in the world, has like less than 20 to maybe 30. That is not enough to create a therapeutic change to be able to feed the hair follicles. There are so many barriers that a person is up against genetically. The color of the skin, if it's darker, they're going to get less vitamin D. If they have insulin resistance, diabetes, obesity, air pollution, blocking the sun, there's so many different barriers that are going on to prevent vitamin D. So what do you need to do? You need to make sure that the blood values when you get your test are at least 70 nanograms per milliliter up to 100 or even more, okay? You need higher amounts to be able to penetrate through all the barriers. I'm gonna recommend daily amounts of at least 20,000 I use every single day. Now, the first thing that comes to people's mind is, oh my gosh, that's a toxic amount. No, it's not. If you were out in the sun in the summer for 40 minutes, this is how much vitamin D that you would get. No one will ever tell you that being out in the sun for 40 minutes is gonna to be toxic to you. They might say that don't get burned, but the point is that you get vitamin D from the sun and you're gonna get like every 20 minutes, you're gonna get another 10,000 and that is not toxic at all. Toxicity levels for vitamin D occur when you're taking hundreds of thousands of vitamin D3 every single day for months and especially without the cofactors. This is why I'm recommending the magnesium with it, at least 50 milligrams, and take that at night. But you wanna take the cofactors, magnesium, K2, zinc. So this data about vitamin D is interesting as it relates to the hair, but it's even more interesting that you can't really go by these low normals, okay? Because this is a different system. So we wanna raise this higher by taking more of it on a daily basis, with the cofactors. Now, if you have no hair in your head and you have calcification in your scalp, then you might wanna take even a little bit more magnesium over a period of time because that can eventually help regulate the amount of calcium buildup in the soft tissues. Now, there are a few more nutrients I wanna share with you related to the hair because I just talked about the most important one and the blood test, but let's get into the other ones. And I also wanna mention that vitamin D also inhibits this DHT from destroying this follicle. So vitamin D protects you against high levels of this very powerful form of testosterone. So vitamin D does a lot, but there's also other uh, nutrients like zinc controls the growth and repair. If you're deficient in zinc, you can have dry hair as well, and you can have just short hairs or even hair loss. So that's, that's very important. Iron is also important in the red blood cells. So when you get your ferritin levels tested, make sure it's above 70. You're normally gonna see this in a situation where a woman is menstruating and they're losing iron, in which case they need to consume more red meat or liver or liver pills, something like that. But you might also see it in men with too much ferritin or too much iron. Now, wait a second, how could that correlate? Well, what happens, there's certain genetic problems where we tend to accumulate more iron, in which case we're very deficient in iron at the same time. This is why, especially men that have too much iron are severely anemic because it just doesn't work. In that case, you might need to go donate blood because it can be very toxic, but it can also affect your hair because it's locked up and you also become anemic. And also if you're B12 deficient, which you need for the red blood cells, you need iron and B12, then the hair follicle can't get oxygen. So it's another test to uh, take a look at, as well as your omega-3s. If you're low in omega-3 because maybe you're doing a lot of seed oil, that can also create dryness of the hair. Anyway, it's a lot to unpack. I think it's very important. Start taking vitamin D and also magnesium. And please comment down below if this helps you with any problem that you have with your hair. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.